Well, good evening to you, Victory Through Faith Church. I speak blessings on you all in the name of Jesus Christ. I also speak and decree blessings over those that watch us routinely on YouTube or online via our website. I pray that you be blessed exceedingly, abundantly, and above all that you ask for or think as well. You know, we're going to have our midweek message to the, today, this evening, and I'm really looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to sharing with you what the Spirit of God has given me to share with you. Uh, before we get into that, though, I got a prompting from the Spirit of God to pray for a particular area. Uh, so what I'll do, I'll pray for the word today and then I'll come back and I'll let you know what we're going to pray about specifically before we get into the word. How about that? Father God, I just thank you for another opportunity to come boldly before your throne of grace and teach your word with accuracy and with simplicity. I pray now that our hearts are ready and receptive to receive wisdom and revelation knowledge as your word goes forth. I stand against and bind up every hindrance and distraction that the enemy would try to bring up to rob us of the revelation of the word of God. And I pray right now that we receive at least one word from you, Lord God, that we can apply to our lives to bring about a radical change. Father God, we give you the floor, all of you, none of me. In Jesus name, amen. Well, like I said, I'm going to pray for a particular area before we get into the word tonight. Uh, it's not really related to the word. However, I was prepping. I was actually spending some time with the father this morning and the spirit of God began to deal with me. And he told me before I started with the midweek message today, he told me to pray uh, for emotional and mental trauma to be relieved, which was interesting because that's not something that the Spirit of God has ever really talked to me or dealt with me or not in that particular way that he worded it. So uh, before we pray for emotional and mental trauma to be relieved, first of all, I want to define trauma and then I want to give you two words to stand on. If you were if you were with us during our Protect Your Peace series, then you've already heard these scriptures. But these are the two scriptures that I believe the Spirit of God gave me to give to you so you can build yourself up in faith to stand against the onslaught and the attack of the enemy. Because whether you know it or not, if you are dealing with mental and or emotional trauma, you are under attack. Satan is trying his best to steal, kill and destroy. And he's using the weapon of trauma, mental and emotional trauma to try to put you in a place to where you're ready to give up, fold in the towel and just let whatever happens, happens. He's hitting you with one thing after another. Seems like every time you wake up, you're hearing a new issue. And so the spirit of God wanted me to pray with you and pray for you concerning mental and emotional trauma. The two scriptures we're going to read from are Isaiah 26 verse 3. I'll read 3 and 4 and John 14 27. You ready? I'm going to read from the King James Version of the Bible. So in Isaiah 26 3 it says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Verse 4 says, Trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. So don't trust you. Don't trust in yourself. He will keep you in perfect peace if your mind is stayed on him. And I love verse four or verse three says because he trusted because you trust in him. Verse four says trust in the Lord. How often? Forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. And then the second scripture that I want to read is John 14 27 it says peace I leave with you this is Jesus talking he says peace I leave with you my peace I give unto you not as the world gives give I unto you let not your heart be troubled neither let it be afraid so don't allow your heart to be troubled don't allow your heart to be afraid stand against mental trauma Stand against, stand against emotional trauma. Stand against everything that the enemy is trying to hit you with those thoughts, that feeling of 
being overwhelmed, those feelings of wanting to give up and give in, those feelings of just wanting to go somewhere and hide under a rock, that's because you're dealing with mental and or emotional trauma. So I want to pray with you right now to receive deliverance because he said pray for emotional trauma mental and emotional trauma to be relieved, not just to deal with it. He wants it to be relieved. Okay, that's good, Lord. Why relieved? Because it's a it's, it's a pressure force being applied to you to try to remove and get you away from your faith in God, to try to get you away from the word, to try to get you away from what you believe concerning the word and concerning your life. And he said, I need to pray for you so that that emotional and that mental trauma can be relieved. Amen. And when we talk about trauma, we're talking about disturbing and distressing experiences or we're talking about this is good. We're talking about emotional shock that follows a stressful event, emotional shock. There are things that have rocked you. And God says he wants you to be relieved from that emotional and mental trauma that you are experiencing every day due to shocking experiences you have been through. So let me pray with you right now. Father God, I pray according to the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit. And I pray according to the power that works within me. Lord, I declare right now that your children who are struggling with mental and emotional trauma right now will be relieved in the name of Jesus. Father God, I come against, I stand against pain. I stand against trauma. I stand against stress. I stand against worry, Lord. And I declare that your peace that passes all understanding will guard their hearts and minds like a like a security guard would, Lord God, like an umpire over their hearts and their minds, Lord God. I bind up the shock. I bind up the stress. I bind up the fatigue they are experiencing because of one hit after the other, Lord God. I declare that that mental and that emotional trauma is relieved now. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, I bind up trauma, I bind up stress, and I loose and release peace, Lord God, peace that surpasses even their own understanding, Lord. I release joy, hallelujah. I release joy, the oil of joy over their lives right now, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Every contradictory thought that rises against your word, Lord God, I condemn it, Lord God. I bind up every weapon that the enemy has formed and I bind up every weapon that the enemy has launched against your children, Lord God. I declare peace in their minds. I declare peace in their souls. I declare peace in their homes, Lord God. I declare that they are walking in a cocoon of peace, Lord God, because it is the very peace that Jesus himself gave us. And we refuse to allow our hearts to be troubled and we refuse to allow ourselves to be afraid. Lord, I speak peace. I speak shalom, Lord God, right now in their lives, Lord God, peace that they cannot attain naturally, peace that makes no sense due to what they've been through, Lord God. But I speak, yeah, I speak an ease into their homes right now, an ease into their situation, Lord God, where they are feel relief. And freedom from oppression and pressure now in Jesus name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, I want you to do something to seal what we just prayed. I want you to make a declaration of faith. And remember, faith is not about feeling a certain way. Faith is not even about seeing things. Faith is about believing what God's word has said about your situation and then acting on it. So and as, as an act of your faith, I want you to make this declaration with me. Say this. I believe and receive the peace of God over my mind and my emotions in Jesus name. Let's say that again. I believe and I receive the peace of God over my mind and over my emotions now 
in Jesus name. Glory to God, because faith is always now. Don't wait to feel it before you say it. Don't wait to see it before you decree it. You got to speak those things that be not as though they were, because if you say what God said, it already is. Glory to God. Enjoy the peace of God that passes all understanding. It's going to overwhelm you just like the pressure hit. That peace is going to overwhelm the pressure and allow you to rest and be at ease. I speak it and I speak it into existence and I decree it right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, I pray you have received that. I was ready to share it with you. So let's go. Let's go. Let's get into the midweek message today. Tonight. Glory to God. We are starting with part two of the series we began last week, Feed Your Faith. Feed Your Faith. And I'm going to go as far as I can go tonight, and I'll cap it when I get a release to And if necessary, we'll pick up with part three next week. But let's go. Let's see how far we can go. Our proof text is Romans chapter 12. Hey, glory to God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Receive his peace right now. Because your mind is trying to ramp back up. Just receive that peace. Don't try to figure it out. Don't try to understand it. Just say, I receive your peace, Lord God, and just let it wash over you. Let it wash over you. Let it wipe away those cares, those concerns, those worries, those fear. Yeah. Let it wipe away those what ifs. Let it wipe away those what abouts. Just just let it wash over you now in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Our proof text for our series, Feed Your Faith, is Romans chapter 12, and I'm only going to read verse 3. Last week, we read verses 1 through 3, but for the sake of the lesson and for the sake of time, I'm only going to read verse 3, and it says, For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to just a few men. No, God has dealt this to every man. God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. So we learned last week, I'm going to give you about four or five points of review. We learned last week that it is our responsibility to feed the measure of faith that God has given us. It's our responsibility to feed, to develop and to maintain and to actually put into operation the measure of faith that God has given us. And we learn that we feed our faith by continually hearing the word of God. The Bible says in Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the more word you hear, the more faith comes to increase your measure. God gives you the measure, but you got to keep hearing the word to grow and develop and increase that measure. Amen. And we also learn that we need to feed our faith every single day. Joshua 1, 8, Psalms chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 give validity to the truth that we must feed our faith every single day. Joshua 1 says, meditate in that word day and night. So we don't do it every now and then. We don't just do it once a day. We do it day and night. Glory to God. You cannot prosper God's way without feeding on the word of God continually. You cannot and will not prosper the way God wants and desires for you to prosper without feeding on the word of God continually. We also learn that the more you feed your faith, glory to God. I love listening to this. Now, this was a revelation. The more you feed your faith, the greater your capacity for prosperity and success. Now, if you you don't need to go any further than Joshua chapter one, verse eight for that. The more you feed your faith, meditate in the word day and night, then the greater your capacity for prosperity and success. The more you feed your faith by meditating on the word day and night, the greater your capacity for prosperity and success. And we learned that the word of God is spiritual food. We call it spiritual protein that causes our faith measure to grow. And I will turn to first Peter two real quick because I wanted to show that out. It tells us to desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. I just quoted it to you, but I'll read it again. It says as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word or protein of the word 
that you may grow thereby. So your measure won't grow if you don't feed it the word. Hallelujah. If you want your measure of faith to grow, you got to feed it the word and you got to feed it the word. How often? Day and night. If you want your measure of faith to grow, you got to feed it. You got to develop it and you got to operate out of it. We might talk about that a little later in the lesson. If not, I'll get to it at another time. And this is a revelation that the spirit of God gave me as I was re-listening to what we learned last week. Many of us listen to this. We said this last week. Many of us are trying to operate on a level of living that our faith cannot support or sustain. My God, listen to that. I'll say it again. Many of us are trying to operate. That's why he's telling us to feed our faith, because he wants you to live on a higher level. However, we're trying to live on a level that our faith cannot sustain. I think we talked about trying to lift a thousand pound problem with five pound faith. You just can't do that. Or maybe you're trying to receive a thousand pound promise, but you only got five pound faith. You can only receive from God according to the measure of your faith. Amen. So if you want to receive more from God, you need to develop and feed your faith more. You need to feed, develop maintain and operate out of that measure so that you can receive more from God so that you can live on a higher level so that you can do more of the things that God wants you to do so you can perform the works that Jesus said we will be able to perform many of us need to be operating in the greater works that Jesus spoke about however our faith is not built up to the point to do so our faith in God and his word we don't have to have faith in ourselves God never told us to have faith in ourselves yet. The Bible says in Mark 11, 22, have faith in God. And that means if you have faith in God, you also must have faith in his ability. Amen. Many of us are trying to operate on a level of living that our faith simply cannot support, cannot sustain. So it's of the utmost importance that we feed our faith. We got to go higher. We got to go higher. And in order to go higher, you got to go deeper. Amen. If you want to grow higher, you got to go deeper. What am I talking about? If you want to go higher in God, you got to have deeper roots because the higher you go. Wow. OK, this is for big boys and girls. The higher you go, the heavier the opposition. And we're going to look at an example of that in a moment. The higher you go in God, the heavier the opposition. So you've got to make sure that your roots are rooted, uh, that you're rooted down deep in the word of God so that you can go higher and higher in him and not be swayed by the opposition, not be swayed by tribulation. Don't let tribulation trip you up. It's just what the enemy does is part of being in this fallen world. But as long as you continue to feed your faith and operate out of that measure of faith, develop that measure of faith, then you can do what God placed and put you on this planet to do and you can do it without falling. Glory to God. We just don't want to do it. That's good, Lord. We want to be able to do it without falling and faltering. We want our witness to last. Oh, that's good, Lord. We want our witness to last as long as the works do. We don't want to be counted in the number of those that I remember when they did that, but you hadn't heard from them. I remember when they did that, but we hadn't seen them. No, our witness will last as long as the works do, because we're going to operate not only in faith and we're not going to operate only in grace, we're going to operate in, in integrity. Amen. We're going to do what pleases the Lord. So let's dig into part two. Amen. Glory to God. I'm excited about this. Turn to Matthew chapter seven. And then we're also going to look at Luke chapter six, because I want to show you something. And then those two passages are what we call parallel passages where they uh, they uh, give an account of the same story. One is from the Gospel of Matthew. One is from the Gospel of Luke. Same account, different perspectives from a spiritual point of view that we can get more information and we can glean something different from each account. So let's start. Let's go. Let's go. Part two. Here we go. If you fail to feed your faith, oh my goodness, this is big. If you fail to feed your faith, not just you, if we fail, if anybody, any believer fails to feed their faith, when the time comes to use it, you won't be prepared. When, if you fail to feed your faith, and the time will come when you need it, if you fail to feed your faith, and by feed, remember we talked, we said that feed means to develop, to maintain, and or to operate. So if you fail to develop your faith, if you fail to maintain your faith, and if you fail to operate out of your faith, when the time comes for you to use it, you won't be prepared 
and you won't be properly equipped. So you got to start now. Yeah, you got to start now. Now, God will catch you up. You don't have to worry about the time you lost. He's a redeemer of time. So he'll catch you up. But you have to put forth the effort and the energy. He needs effort. Oh, that's good. Lord. He needs three E's from you. He needs effort, energy and endurance. Glory to God. If you give God your effort, if you give God your energy and if you give God your endurance, hallelujah, then he'll handle all the rest. He'll lead you through that thing. That's good. That's revelatory. You need to write that down. Give God the three E's, effort, energy and endurance, and he'll see to it that you are successful according to the word. So if you fail to feed your faith, when the time comes to use it, you won't be prepared. Let's look at Matthew chapter seven before we go to Luke chapter six in Matthew's gospel chapter seven. Let's see. OK, I start at verse 24. It says, therefore, whosoever heareth. Now, how does faith come by what? Hearing. So we know that just when we read whosoever heareth these sayings, faith is coming because every time the word is heard, faith comes. We not we might not act on it or we might not digest it, but it comes. So the Bible says Jesus is talking. Verse 24 of Matthew seven. Therefore, whoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house. And it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that hears these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house. But guess what? It fell and great was the fall of it. See, we want to do what God wants us to do and we don't want it to fall. We don't want it to be destroyed. We want everything we do for the Lord to remain the test of time. Now, let's look at this in the parallel passage in Luke's account, the gospel of Luke. I love this. I, I just love flipping through the Bible. You know, we got tablets, we got phones, we got laptops, we got all these electronic devices. And that's cool. Get the word in however you can get the word in. But I'm just of the belief that there's something special when you flip pages. Amen. There's just something special that occurs when you flip some pages. Glory to God. I can't explain it. Can't even quantify it, but I believe it. OK, Luke chapter six. We're going to start at verse 47. Jesus talking again. He says, whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and do with them. So that's faith. We come, we hear, we do. That's faith. We come, we hear, and we do. Jesus said, whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and do with them, I will show you to whom he is like. And we learn that he's like a wise man in Matthew's account. Verse 48 says he is like a man which built an house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and it could not shake it for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not heareth and doeth not hears but doesn't do anything. Wow. It's like a man that without a foundation. So if I hear it, but I don't do anything, there's no foundation laid for me. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. Jesus. Now, I want you to notice something. Because in Matthew's account and in Luke's account, we we see that although there were different levels of preparation, the storm and the negative issue, the negative circumstances hit both people. 
You got the wise man. You got the unwise man. You got the man who dig deep and laid his foundation on a rock. And then you got the man that didn't lay his then build on the foundation at all. The same circumstance hit both people. So it's important to get this. God does not decide whose house will stand. Uh, Jesus, listen, listen, listen to this. If you catch this, this will change your life. God does not decide whose house will stand and whose house will fall. I know we say, oh, can I touch it, Lord? Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, I know we say God is in control and whatever God wants to do, God's going to do. Well, if you really know your Bible. And if you really spend time with the spirit of God for any any amount of time, you will quickly learn that to say God is in control is is it's an incomplete statement. God has all control. However, God is not in control of every day to day affair on this planet because God gave control to Adam when he created. He told, hey, you have dominion. I'm giving it to you. Adam transferred it to Satan when he rebelled and chose what Satan told him to do. Jesus came and redeemed us back into a position of power after he defeated Satan. But Jesus and God won't activate their ultimate control over all things until Jesus comes back the second time. And then Satan is forever sentenced to the lake of fire. So in the interim, in the meantime, God expects us to use the power that he's given us us through the Holy Spirit to accomplish what he wants us to do on this planet. So we can't just sit back and say, well, if it happened to me, it was God's will. No, because something can happen to you that is Satan's will. Something can happen to you where you can be stolen from, where you or someone you love can be killed or some situation in your life can be destroyed. And that's not God saying, well, today is time for you to die or today is time for you to be robbed or today is time for you to get sick. That's not what God does. Just like in the text, the storm came and hit both people, the man that prepared and the man that did not prepare. But God did not choose whose house got hit. Stuff happened. Look, OK, John 16, 33. Let me turn there real quick just to let you know. I, I've quoted this so many times before. I've mentioned it in teaching other lessons, but I want you to know where you can go to turn to it. In John chapter 16, verse 33, this is what Jesus said. He said, these things I have spoken unto you that in me you may have or might have peace. In the world, you shall have tribulation. In the world, you're going to have problems. In the world, you're going to have issues. In the world, you're going to have storms. In the world, you're going to have things happen to you that you did not account for. It's not God causing it to happen. It's a byproduct of living in a broken, fallen world world system. So stop believing that everything that happens to you is God's hand. Everything that happens to you is not God's hand. Many of the things that happen to us are because we live in a broken, fallen world system. Now, if Jesus would have stopped right there, then we would have no hope. See, he said in the world, you're going to have some tribulation, but he doesn't stop there because he said something that I love. I always say this word cancels out whatever came before. So Jesus said in the world, you will have tribulation. But glory to God, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The Amplified Version says, I have deprived the world of power to harm you, but you got to use it because you got to work the word and you got to trust the power that I've given to you and you've got to enact the authority that I've entrusted to your care. Glory to God. So everything you go through is not God. I I want to move on, but he's here. If we cannot put everything on God, precious people. Well, you know, I got fired. I guess God was just showing me that I need to get ready for the next move. Well, I lost my loved one. I guess God was just showing me that I can't be dependent on this person anymore. That is not the truth. God does not. Listen, listen, listen. I'm going to debunk something for you. You pray. I pray you receive it. If not, I still love you. God did not take your loved one. God does not take people from this planet. The scriptures only give us two or three accounts of when, Jesus, when God took somebody from this planet. 
And let me share something with you. When God took them, they were not dead. Mm. When God took them, they did not die. God took Jesus while he was alive. Amen. Enoch was translated because he pleased God. He didn't have to touch death. So you don't have to believe for another day that your loved one died because God need another angel for his garden. When you die, you don't become an angel. I've said it before. Death is not the end. Death is transition. And if you became an angel when you died, that would be a demotion for you. Because the angels say, who is man that you are mindful of him? How did you give him all this authority? How did you give him all this power? And then the Bible also says, stop referring to angels. Are they not all ministering spirits or servants sent to serve those who are heirs of salvation? So angels are here to serve us. So if we die, and become an angel. Why would we die and be demoted? No, my beloved child. You don't become an angel when you die. We die because we live in a fallen world and sometimes situations overcome our will to be here. And sometimes because Satan roams about as a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour, sometimes bad situations occur in a good person's life. But it wasn't God saying, well, it was just time for me. To, the Bible says there is appointed to man once to die. It does not say that there is a particular appointment for every person to die there. Oh, I'm going to release something right now. And I pray you can receive it. If you don't remember, I still love you. There is not a time stamped in heaven for you to die. I know I'm, I know many of you may have heard that before, and I promise you I'm not coming against who you heard it from. I just want you to know the truth so the truth can set you free. There is not a time stamped in heaven where you must die. It's not God's will. It's not how God operates. He said that he wants you to have long life. So if he wants everybody to have long life, why would he assign a time for you to die early? Now, I granted, I know stuff happens that we can't explain. People leave this place that we just we can't grasp it. We don't. We always say, wow, them. I don't understand it, Lord. How did you let this happen? Well. We live in a world that's broken and sometimes bad things happen to good people. And it's not because and it's not always because they were doing something dastardly or they because because they were living in some secret sin. Sometimes bad things just happen. We always say, well, God, why didn't you step in? Can I share something with you? Why didn't we? I believe that the spirit of God will deal with people's hearts about things that are coming because it is his job. He's our helper. I think there are many a multitude of reasons why we don't always heed those warnings and heed that instruction. Uh, and, and I know we're touching on some sensitive issues here, but I got to hit you with the truth. Back to what we were talking about. God didn't decide whose house stood and whose house fell. The difference between the success and failure of both houses was the individual's foundation or the lack thereof. That's why I'm talking to you about feeding your faith. Let, let's look at Luke again. Luke 6, 46. Well, I love that. And why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever comes to me and hears my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house, dig deep, laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, not if... When the flood arose, that means it's not about when, if it happened, it's going to happen. When the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon it, for it was found, at, for the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not. Why do bad things happen to good people? Because sometimes, I'm talking about particularly children of God, because a lot of, sometimes we hear, but we don't do. Man, sometimes we hear, but we don't do. We go to church every week. We hear the pastor. We hear the preacher share an awesome word, but we don't put into practice what we heard. And so when the flood comes, we are subject to the same thing the world is subject to because, yeah, we heard it and we thought faith came because we heard it in church. But that's not the type of hearing that causes faith to come. 
Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing until you get the revelation of it for yourself. But he that heareth and doeth not. It's like a man that without a foundation built the house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently, vehemently and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. God, I'll say it one more time and I'm going to move on. God did not select which house would be destroyed and God did not select which house would stand. God gave each person the freedom to prepare their house the way they needed to prepare. One chose to prepare it on the foundation of bedrock. Another chose not to put it on the foundation at all. Uh, Matthew talks about build this house on a sand on sand. And so when inevitably trials of life hit, only one house will be able to stand that which is built on the rock. Jesus is the rock. Glory to God. So you got to build your life on Jesus. The word made flesh. Jesus is the word and the word is Jesus. That's what you got to build your life on. You got to feed your faith on the word of God. Listen to this. It's too late to try to lay a foundation when the storm hits. Let's go back to Matthew for this real quick. I want to I want to show you in Matthew's account. Verse 25 says the rain descended. The floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. Verse 27 says, and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. So notice on both houses, the rain descended, the floods came and the winds blew. The only difference between one falling and one standing is that one had a foundation upon rock, a solid foundation. And a lot of the times uh, there are often times when the storm actually hits. That's when we try to run to the word. We try to run back to church. We try to go pull out all our old messages and listen to a bunch of word to help us. But at that point, more often than not, it's too late. You know, it's, it's really difficult to lay a firm foundation in the middle of a rainstorm. The Bible says the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew. See, when the rain's falling and the floods are building up and the wind is blowing, it's really, really, really difficult to build a foundation. And even if you do succeed, it's not going to set in time because the conditions aren't right. So you got to build the foundation when you're not in a storm. Listen to me. You got to build the foundation when you are not in a storm. Ex knowing that a storm will come. It's not a negative confession. You're not believing for problems. You just know in this world you're going to have some tribulation. So I'm building a firm foundation for what will inevitably come. Now, I'm not scared of what comes because I know Christ has given me the victory. Hallelujah. So I'm building my foundation. So when the storm comes, I know everything I stand on is secure and it's firm. It's too late to try to lay a foundation. When the storm hits, feed your faith now so you can be prepared for what is to come. Don't wait. Feed your faith now so you can be prepared for what is to come. Listen to this. And this is why we're talking about feeding your faith. And this is why feeding your faith is so important, because how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Feeding your faith now prepares you for what is to come. Jesus told us this in John 17, verse 14. He says, I have given them thy word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. He says in verse 15, I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil. It's implied the evil that's in the world. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So he says, I don't want you to take them out. I want you to protect them in it. I want you to separate them from the problems and the stress and the strain and the fear and the worry that's in the world. How does he expect that to occur? Listen to verse 17. Jesus says, sanctify them or set them apart through thy truth. And then he lets us know what truth is. Your word is truth. So if we combine that with what we read in Matthew and in Luke, the truth of God's word is the foundation that we need to set our lives upon. 
We don't move by opinion and we don't move by facts. We move by the truth of God's word. What has God said? What has God declared? I build my life on truth. And what is truth? Jesus tells us your word is truth. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the truth. What is the truth? The word of God. Amen. So the more truth you hear, the more faith arises in your heart. And the more faith arises in your heart, the better equipped you are to stand and withstand the storms of life. Mm. That's what we call that faith fight. First Timothy 6, 12 says, fight the good fight of faith. That's what it's talking about. The good fight of faith is standing on the truth when I'm experiencing in the world something opposite to what I know the truth to be. See, just because you are experiencing something that seems to be the polar opposite of what the truth has declared does not mean that the truth is any less valid or any less potent. It just means that I got to fight the good fight of faith and I got to stand on what I believe according to the word of God and not what I'm feeling or what I'm seeing in the world because I know what the world is going to offer, but I also know what God has done. So in the interim, in the meantime and in between time, I'm going to build myself up on my most holy faith. I'm going to pray in the spirit. I'm going to feed myself on the word of God. How often? Day and night because then I'll make my way prosperous and then I'll have good success. Mm. It's of the utmost importance. <sighs> That we start now feeding our faith before the fight begins, before the storm shows up, before you have to stand for a financial breakthrough, before you have to stand for a healing in your body, before you have to stand for whatever it is you have to stand for, before you have to stand for a family member, before you have to stand for mental mental relief from what you're going through. You got to feed your faith now. Feed your faith with the word of God consistently, continually, ad nauseum, ad infinitum. You just keep on and keep on and keep on and keep on. Every day I feed my faith. There's not a day go by that I won't feed my faith. Why? Because I got to build myself up because I know what's coming. Not only do I know what's coming, I got to build myself up because I live by faith. The just shall live by faith. For we walk by faith, not by sight. And faith comes by hearing the word. What is the word? His word is truth. So the more word I digest, the more truth I build my life on. And the more truth I build my life on, the more secure I am against the devil's lies. Because that's all he can do. All he's going to do is lie. All he can do is lie. Whether he omits part of the truth or whether it's just a blatant, outright, demonic lie. Yo, that's good, Lord. Thank you. Your situations can lie to you. You might feel as though your situation is the dominant force in your life, but it is not. What God has said about you rings and reign, rings true and reigns supreme. So if your situation, li listen to this. This is good. We're going to get ready to shut this down. If your situation does not match what God's word has said about your life. God's not a man that he should lie and God ain't lying to you. Your situation is hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, one of our ministers at the church evangelist Norwood preached several years ago and she said those circumstances can lie to you. God ain't lying. Your situation is. Mm. God ain't lying to you. Your circumstances are lying. So you got to stand flat footed and boldly on the truth of God's word. And you got to believe it in your heart and you got to confess it out of your mouth. And you got to act on what God's word said. Even if you shaking while you do it, even if you don't even feel it, you don't listen to this. You don't have to feel it. You just got to believe it. Amen. The more getting ready to bring this to a close, the more you feed on the word of God, the greater your capacity for faith will grow. The more you feed on the word of God, feed your faith, feed your faith, feed your faith. The more you feed on the word of God, the greater your capacity for faith grows. And what is capacity? Capacity is the power to perform. That's good. Capacity is the power to produce or perform. So the more you feed on the word of God, the greater your power to produce and perform becomes. Glory to God. 
Well, that's all I got for you. I'm going to stop it right there. Praise God. I believe that's enough to get you charged and ready to go. Hey, feed your faith. Start tonight. Get in your Bible. You don't have to do 30 minutes. You don't have to do an hour. You don't have to do two hours. Just spend some time in the word. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you what you need to read and just get into it and let him lead you. Amen. Feed your faith, feed your faith, feed your faith so your measure can grow. Well, I'll talk to you later. I love you with all my heart. I'll be praying for you every single day. And remember this, this is something you got to know. You are already empowered by faith. You are equipped for service and your success is in God's word. I love you. Be blessed in Jesus name.